So we're continuing our series in the parables that Jesus taught. And today we're going to study one of the most famous parables that most people know, and that is the parable of the Good Samaritan. So this parable is actually told in response to a lawyer that asked Jesus a question with a motive to test Jesus. So he asked Jesus a question, and his motive is really to test Jesus. So it starts off in Luke 10, in verse 25, it says this, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? What shall I do to inherit eternal life? So we see the motive for the question was to test Jesus, but we have to agree the question was actually a good one that everyone should ask and be concerned with. How do I inherit eternal life? Don't you wish people would come up to you and ask you that question? Hey, how do I inherit eternal life? I'm like, okay, well, you came to the right place because I'll tell you. So this question needs to be settled for each person. And the question is, is that, Is that question answered for you? If someone were to ask you that question, what would you answer? Are you able to clearly tell someone what the answer that what the answer to that is? So there's kind of two questions here in a sense is what would you say as far as your salvation? Somebody said, hey, are you going to heaven? How would you answer? And then if somebody asked you, hey, how do I get to heaven? How would you answer? Well, I hope that you would answer something like this, that we are all sinners in need of a Savior, and Jesus is that Savior. Jesus died on the cross to pay the price for our sins, and three days later rose from the grave to prove that he is God. And he tells us that all who believe will have eternal life. Hopefully you would answer something like that that Jesus Christ is our Savior, only through trusting in him, not by any good works, is a person saved. So interestingly enough, Jesus doesn't answer exactly like that one. One reason why Jesus doesn't answer like that is the cross did not happen yet. But the other reason, he was communicating to the lawyer that was testing him that in order for a person to inherit eternal life on their own, notice, on their own, they would need to perfectly follow the law. You get that? So Jesus was answering this man based upon the test that this man was giving Jesus. Like, hey, Jesus, how do you inherit eternal life? And Jesus was like, well, from the heart that you're asking, the way that you would, you would need to be perfect. So we can see next, the lawyer knew God's law. So he knew what the law actually was. So let's follow in in verse 26. It says, and he said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he, the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. So now Jesus answered this lawyer that repeated the law to him, do this and you will live. So the lawyer answered with a combination of two scriptures that summed up the law. The first was in Deuteronomy 6, 5. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And then Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So now Jesus told him, if you follow these things, you will live. So I'm sure at this point, a lot was going on in this man's mind. And one of those being this, I haven't followed that perfectly, but he may be thinking, Of course I loved God with all my heart and with all my soul and with all my might and with all my strength, with all my strength and mind. But no one would know if I haven't. I mean, think about that. If somebody's like, oh, how's your spiritual life? How's your prayer life? You're like, good, good. You know what I mean? Like you could easily pacify anybody who asks, like, how are you doing spiritually? How's your relationship with God? Do you really truly love God? And you could say, yeah, yeah, I do. But there's no way really for people to know your heart and to know where you're at. But this love my neighbor thing, this lawyer might be thinking, 
I'm not so sure I've done that, and I think that other people might realize that I haven't done it. Because the truth is, is people observe how we treat other people. So easily someone could look at one of us and say, well, yeah, I mean, they're kind of a loving person, but not all the time. So this would have been a perfect time for him to ask Jesus, what if I fail? Jesus, you just, I regurgitated the law to you. You said you're right. That's the law. What if I fail? Like, let's just paint a picture here, Jesus. I have a friend who didn't really follow this. What about him? What if he fails? Okay, he could even did that. Nothing in the account shows any sort of humility on this lawyer's part. Nothing in the account. It's almost like he was testing Jesus, and he would never admit that he was wrong. So listen to the next verse, verse 29. It says, but he, listen, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? So now he's like kind of playing a game with Jesus here, okay? Well, Jesus, who is really my neighbor? Is it just the guy next door? Or is it just the people across the street? So the lawyer wanted to justify himself because he knew he did not love his neighbor as he loved himself. So he wanted to get off on a technicality, technicality, which was those people that I did not love in this way, they weren't really my neighbors anyway, right? So you see what he's doing here? He's trying to like pick and choose who he should love and who his neighbors are. Now, Jesus tells this parable, and he teaches two primary things. The first is to love your neighbor. It takes empathy. And the second is that everyone is our neighbor. So let's get into the parable. Jesus tells a parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, we do not know the man, but it's most likely he was a Jewish man because he was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. Sadly, this man gets mugged. Now, in verse 31, it says, Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him pass by on the other side. So first, we have this priest. He's a religious man, right? So this priest is a religious man, and most would expect a religious leader to stop and help. Isn't that what religious leaders are supposed to do, to help people in their time of need? I'll never forget, long time ago when I was a youth pastor, and do you remember that baby blue van we had? It was our first van that we ever got. So it was one of our first trips in that first van. We went down to Ocean City, New Jersey for a concert. It was a Christian concert, had a van load of kids, and we pulled up, and we didn't want to be late. And as we pulled into the parking lot, there was two young guys with a, with, in a car, and the car had its hood open. And they were asking people that were walking, does anybody have jumper cables? Can anybody help us out? And we just kind of walked past like everybody else did. Does anybody have jumper cables? Can anybody help us out? And I was like, eh, you know, I really say much. And then I hear the one kid goes, the church won't even help us. I was like, oh, I guess I'm going to help. <laughs> okay. So I turn around. We had jumper cables. We helped. But in my mind, I was thinking before that, I got this group of kids. I'm a young youth pastor. We got this new van. It's one of our first trips. I got to get the kids to the concert. I could think of every reason why I shouldn't help until I heard that kid say, the church won't even help. And I was like, okay, that can't be on our back. So the religious leaders, right, are supposed to help. And this priest walked past. Then we have a Levite. Levite's principal role in the temple was singing psalms during the temple services, performing construction, 
excuse me, and maintenance for the temple, serving as guards, performing other services. So Levites also served as teachers and judges, maintaining cities of refuge in biblical times. So here's a very important person, has a lot of responsibilities. The Levite passes by as well. A man with resources, probably the ability to help, responsibilities, and he passes by as well. Now, when we think about this, oh boy, a bee found me. <laughs> um, when we think about this, we start to judge these men, right? We start to judge these men. We look, can't believe it. I can't believe the priest. I can't believe the Levite. Notice Jesus never says why they didn't stop. So he doesn't give any good reasons why they didn't stop, but he just tells us who they are, their titles, and the fact that they didn't stop. So let's stop for a minute and ask ourselves a couple of questions. Why would I not stop? Okay, ask yourself this question. Why would I not stop? I'm walking down the road and I see a guy laying in bloody mess, beat up and mugged, and I see him there. Why would I not stop? Well, here's a couple of reasons why most of us might not stop. Maybe you're on your way to do something important and you can't be late. Well, I got something to do, okay? I'm, I'm on my way to do something important and I can't be late. Maybe, maybe you're afraid the muggers are still around. And if you stop, they might mug you too. Maybe you're even thinking, maybe he's like friends with the muggers and that's how they're trying to mug more people. So your mind's going, right? You, you would think that. Some of you might think that. Or maybe if you're honest with yourself, you just don't really care that much. Okay, you're like, stinks to be him. Okay, glad it's not me, and I'm gonna go along my way. Or maybe you feel like you can't help. Like, what am I really gonna do here? Okay, like this guy needs medical attention. I'm not a doctor. This guy might need money. I don't have any. So maybe, you know, there's many reasons, many things you might tell yourself. Now, some of these are good reasons. And some are not so good. But the question we really need to ask ourselves is, how would I feel if I was laying there on the ground after being mugged and no one helped? Okay, how would I feel? How would I feel if I was in this man's shoes? This is what we call empathy, okay? Empathy, the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. Now, I don't think you have to dig too deep to think, how would I feel, okay? How would I feel if that were me? See, when we have empathy for others, it inspires us to try to help them in their difficult situation. When we have empathy for other people, it inspires us to try to help them in their difficult situation. That is why the scripture doesn't just say, love your neighbor. Have you noticed this? It doesn't just say, love your neighbor. What does it say? It says, love your neighbor, how? As yourself. Do you know just that little extra caveat is God saying to us, Jesus reminding us that when you think about how you would feel if you were in that situation, you might be moved to do the right thing. You get that? You might be moved to do the right thing because now you're thinking, ah, if that were me there. You know, maybe, maybe, just maybe, the Levite and the priest never been in a situation like that, so it was hard for them to dig deep. Many of you know this. It's easier to be empathetic to people when you've been through what they've been through, okay? Something happens in your life. You lose somebody in your life. Who reaches out to you? The people that have lost somebody close to them, right? Because they know how it feels. You're sick. Who reaches out to you? The people that have dealt with sickness because they know how it feels. But I don't think we have to go through something to have empathy for other people. So along comes a Samaritan. Now, the fact that this man stops and helps 
is a Samaritan is important to note. The fact that he's a Samaritan, because when we hear a good Samaritan, you know, you might you might not even have any neg- negative connotations to Samaritan because the only time you ever hear Samaritan is after the word good because the parable of the what? The good Samaritan. But about 750 years before Christ, the Assyrians conquered the northern kingdom of Israel where Samaria was located. One of the outcomes one of the outcomes was that Jewish people in that region intermarried with Assyrians, which created a half Assyrian and a half Jewish race, which were called Samaritans. The Jews in the south saw them as half-breeds. They hated them, and they called them dogs. Okay, So this was a hated group of people by the Jews in the south. So let's see what the Samaritan does. Verse 33 says, But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He had compassion. So now we have someone that is hated and looked upon as a dog stop and help. He stopped and helped. I want to stop right there. This lawyer is probably listening and thinking, wait, a Samaritan can have compassion? They're capable of that? Aren't they half-breeds? Aren't they the people that I, was, I learned all my life to hate? Aren't they terrible people? That's why we hate them, right? Because they're terrible. But he had compassion. Now, this is a lesson for anyone that is racist towards a people group. You need to remember they are individual people with feelings and emotions. The reason why people are racist is because they lump everyone into a group based upon their race, their color, where they're from, and they think they're all the same because of the attitudes and the behaviors of a few. And that's why people are racist, because they generalize. They look at a group of people, and they take the attitudes and behaviors of a few, and they hate the whole entire group. Wouldn't that be terrible if someone did that to you? How would you feel if someone did that to you? Hated you just because of your origin or where you were from or maybe what family you were in. Sadly, people do that all the time. We call it ignorance. (laughs) It's obviously unfair, it's unjust, and it's wrong to do. It's wrong to do. So what Jesus is doing is showing the Samaritan Showing that the Samaritan, although hated by many, is an individual person, and he's doing something good for another person. In fact, the person that he was doing good for could possibly be someone that normally hated him because he's a Samaritan. But this man has empathy. He was probably thinking, how would I want to be treated? Okay, I'm walking down the road. And I see this guy suffering. What would I want someone to do for me? So let's see what the Samaritan did. Verse 34. Verse 34, it says this. He went to him, bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. So this guy not only stopped, but he really helped out. He did exactly what any person would want someone else to do for them. In fact, he even had empathy for the innkeeper. Think about this. He had empathy for the innkeeper because he didn't just put this guy on his donkey, bring him to the inn, and said, Here, this guy needs a place to stay. He's your problem, okay? I did my good deed. I'm dumping him here for you. He had empathy for the innkeeper. You know, sometimes that happens at the church. People will be like, oh, yeah, this person's down and out, so they drop him off on our doorstep and say, here, here you go. See you later, you know? (laughs) Like, okay, you know, now you've just dumped someone else on our doorstep. So he didn't even do that. He said, you know what? I'm going to take care of this person. I'm going to take care of this person. I'm going to bring him to the end. I'm going to pay for him. If he charges anything more, I'm going to come back, and I'm going to take care of that as well. 
Now, Jesus ends this parable by asking the lawyer a question. Okay, remember, this lawyer tested him. Jesus tells him this parable. He says, which of these do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? Now, the answer is pretty obvious here, okay? You don't have to dig too deep. The answer is pretty obvious. He said this, the one that showed him mercy. Now, notice, he didn't call him the Samaritan, did he? He didn't say the Samaritan was the neighbor. A lot of theologians think that because this man was taught not even to say the word Samaritan, he couldn't even bring himself to say it without spitting, okay? That's how much Samaritans were hated by the Jews in the South. But he did realize the Samaritan was the real neighbor. He did realize the one who is hated in the society and the culture that he was in was the one who actually rose above and did what was right. Now, the second lesson from this was really loud and clear. The first was, you know, empathy, right? The second is everyone is your neighbor, okay? Every, it's not just the people on your street. It's not just the people next door. It's not just the people you know and love. Everyone is your neighbor. That means we have a responsibility to our fellow man to do good toward them, even if they are from a group of people that you were raised to hate, okay? That means every person is your neighbor. We have a responsibility to love people as we love ourselves. Could you imagine a world like that? Okay, it's not the world we live in. I can tell you that much. Okay, people might try to say, oh, yeah, it's, that's not what's happening right now. But could you imagine a world like that? Well, barely any of us can. But here's the truth. It needs to start with each person, doesn't it? It needs to start with the Christians, okay? We should be known by the way that we love each other. We should be known by the way we love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So Jesus simply says to him at the end of the parable, you go and do likewise. So now Jesus is telling him, you need to follow the example of how this Samaritan, Samaritan was empathetic and had compassion on the man and then took action to help. Will doing this result in salvation for the lawyer? Of course not. But you know what? That lawyer at that time, his motive was to test Jesus. And because of the lawyer's lack of humility, Jesus answered him in the way to help him realize that he is a sinner and he needs salvation and, not, and he cannot save himself. Because you know that's, that lawyer walked away scratching his head saying, I can't do this, okay? You and I walk away from this and say, I can't do this. I can't love like that. But let's step away from the lawyer and look at this through the lenses of how we as believers can love our neighbors. First, we need to have empathy. Then we realize everyone is our neighbor and that we should love those people. But finally, we need to realize this, and this is so important for us as believers. We can only do through this through the power of God, okay? We can only love like this through the power of God. We need to admit that. I don't have that much empathy. I don't have that much love. I can't love like that, so I need help from God. I need reminders often. Part of the reason we observe communion, right, is because we need reminders of God's love and how we should treat each other. He laid down his life for us. That's part of the reason why we observe communion, because we're reminded of the great love and sacrifice that God has laid down his life. You know what? We need reminders. I need a reminder that in myself, I'm the one who passed by, okay? And I'm going to continue to pass by unless I'm reminded that Christ didn't pass by me. I need reminders like that every single day. I'm the one that the lawyer 
like the lawyer, trying to justify every good reason why I'm not doing the things that I should be doing, okay? I don't know if you're like that, but I know I'm like that. So then that brings us to communion because part of communion is actually looking at our own lives and admitting, yeah, I need help. I can't love like that. I'm going to tell myself I'm too busy. I'm going to tell myself there's better things to do. I'm going to tell myself maybe that person deserved to be beat up. I'm going to tell myself a hundred reasons why so I can justify myself and say, hey, listen, I don't know if it was really the right thing for me to do. And that's where we come to communion because that's when we say, you know what? I'm not going to try to fight anymore. I'm not going to justify anymore. I'm going to bring that sin to the cross. I'm going to bring it to the communion table and just say, Lord, you know what? I'm not that person, but I want to be. And I know I can't do it on my own, but I know you could do it through me. And you can help me to be that person that loves their neighbor as I love myself. So if you'd like to grab your communion cups, I'm going to give you a few minutes just of silence where you can look at your own life and ask yourself those tough questions. Lord, am I that person? Do I do those things for others? And you're going to ask Lord for help. You're going to give it to him. Put it at the foot of the cross. So I'll give you a minute or so of silence. On the night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup. He said, This is the cup of my blood, shed for you the cup of the new covenant for forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Bow your heads as I pray. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful for this time that we can remember what your son Jesus did for us on that cross. And Lord, we're thankful for this time that we can come to you and admit where we fail. And not be like this lawyer trying to justify ourselves. But Lord, I just pray that we would admit where we fail, give it to you, and ask for your power and your strength to live like you desire us to live. Which is to love you and love our neighbor as we love ourselves. So we're thankful for that. We're thankful for today. And we just pray all these things in your son's precious name, Jesus. Amen.